let's see how well each evidence weighting policy does in meeting the resolution constraint. So recall that there are two aspects to resolution. First, agreeing on the same belief, and second, having that belief be true. I'll start with privatism. This is the policy that says we're entitled to give our private evidence most of the weight in forming beliefs about religion. It's intuitively clear right away that this policy isn't going to foster agreement. And here's why. Private evidence is more susceptible to religion-related bias than public evidence. This is just because your private evidence is that part of your evidence which the other party is committed to thinking is mistaken. So this is the part that's going to include seemings that are heavily influenced by associations involving religious concepts. So privatism is going to encourage two disagreeing people to emphasize the evidence that most entrenches them in their respective disagreeing views. This includes a very important type of evidence, evidence about the very person who disagrees with you. Now, many belief systems contain private evidence which explains why other people don't hold those beliefs. For instance, atheists like Richard Dawkins think that theists believe in God only because they're psychologically weak and want a cosmic father figure to care for them. And theist philosophers, on the other hand, like Alvin Plantinga, um, might argue that atheists don't believe in God because their minds are clouded by the noetic effects of sin. In other words, private evidence includes any evidence that discredits people who disagree with you about religion. And since many belief systems have such private evidence, an evidence-weighting policy that lets us weight private evidence heavily will actively discourage us from taking people who disagree with us seriously. So in short, privatism scores pretty badly on the agreement part of the resolution constraint. But let's see if privatism does any better in helping disagreeing people form a true belief. So we can see right away that it won't help both disagreeing parties form a true belief, because it discourages them from agreeing, and remember one party has to be mistaken in a disagreement. So at most, privatism can only help one party, and the party it's most likely to help is any person who has biases that are roughly reliable. If your biases are roughly reliable, then your private evidence will be fairly truth-conducive. And in this case, weighting it heavily will tend to give you some strong true beliefs, so confidently held true beliefs. This looks like a good result. But what about the other person whose biases are unreliable? This person's private evidence is unlikely to be very truth-conducive. So in letting her weight it heavily, Privatism lets her sink ever deeper into error. And this is a very bad result. So in effect, we might even think that privatism is a form of epistemic elitism. It lets the people with true beliefs be very confident in them on the basis of their biased private evidence at the expense of an epistemic underclass who is confident in their false beliefs on the basis of their biased evidence. However, when we look closer, we can see that the results aren't even so good for those who believe truly. Now, elites everywhere are susceptible to overconfidence in the power of their privilege, and the same holds for the epistemic elites of privatism. For remember that roughly reliable biases are only that, roughly reliable. They put us at risk at of forming false positive beliefs. So even if our general convictions about religion are true, we might get quite a few of the particulars wrong. For example, suppose first that there's no God, okay? Suppose that I'm an atheist who is very confident in my atheism because of roughly reliable biases in my private evidence. And I'm also right about there being no God in this example. But my biases may also lead me to form certain false beliefs. For example, I might believe that a theist who disagrees with me won't have any good arguments for her position. After all, she's probably a theist because of wishful thinking. But now change the scenario, it works the other way too. Suppose that God does exist, and suppose that I am a confident theist, in part because of roughly reliable biases in my private evidence. Maybe, maybe God gave them to me to give me faith. So I'm right in general about God, but I might also form false positive beliefs, like the belief that God is speaking through this particular sermon, even if he isn't. So even if privatism lets me have a confident true belief on the basis of my private evidence, it will also let me down on many particulars because it doesn't push me to incorporate more neutral considerations. 
So not only does privatism not do anything to help the false believer, it's dangerous for the person believing truly as well. The privatist might object here, of course. So what if your private evidence just is much stronger than your public evidence? Surely it should be allowed to outweigh it sometimes. Think of the great mystics with powerful private evidence of God, like Teresa of Avila. We can't just say that she shouldn't be allowed to take that evidence really seriously. But this objection misconstrues my criticism. I'm not saying that private evidence never outweighs public evidence. All I'm saying is that it cannot be allowed to do so as a matter of policy. So remember the all else equal clauses in the three evidence weighting policies. We saw that there are other factors which affect the weight of evidence besides its being public or private. If the private evidence of the mystic outweighs other evidence she may have against believing in God, it's not because it's private evidence. It's because of some other amazing qualities her evidence has, such as being highly detailed, forceful, or plentiful. So, privatism does very poorly with agreement and has very problematic results when it comes to truth as well.